Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending the talk. Uh, my name is uh, Haixun Wang. I'm with uh, Instacart. I support machine learning and the use of machine learning to optimize the e-commerce and the delivery business. I'm very glad to be here uh, to talk about search and e-commerce. Um, e-commerce has seen explosive growth and search remains the most important channel for customers to access the online service. So over the years, um, actually uh, over the decades, right? Um, how do we improve customer experience for e-commerce has been a very big topic. However, it seems that we haven't made much progress in this domain in the sense that customer experience for online shopping still has a very big room for improvement. So it will be interesting to look at the challenge for uh, e-commerce and to understand how the recent advances uh, in machine learning can help ad advance the field. Um, uh, in particular, uh, I will also uh, take a look at the shopping grocery online because uh, it's actually very interesting. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I myself, like many people I know, only started online grocery shopping after the pandemic. Um, I would like to uh, first thank a few of my colleagues uh, who helped to create the material for uh, this presentation. Uh, we are actually a very small team, um, but we have been uh, growing extremely fast uh, uh, in the recent months and in the last year. Uh, so if you are interested in search or in uh, machine learning in general, uh, I really would like you, uh, uh, I would really like to invite you to join us. Um, uh, here's the uh, agenda of my talk. Uh, first, I will start with the uh, uh, introduction of uh, classical information retrieval. I will talk about the uh, issues, uh, the cost, um, and why we cannot afford uh, doing a lot of things, you know, uh, classical uh, uh, IR uh, requires us to do uh, for e-commerce search. And now, uh, of course, everybody is uh, uh, using uh, neural networks. Uh, everything uh, is about, you know, for NLP, uh, it's about the BERT and the transformers. Uh, language, language models are doing, uh, are actually ruining the world. Uh, so, uh, you know, we want to know what does that mean uh, for search. Um, uh, of course, a lot has been done trying to leverage deep learning for information retrieval. Um, but I'm going to talk about a more gross, a more aggressive approach, uh, which we call a uh, model-based information retrieval. So instead of doing uh, the standard core understanding retrieval and ranking, uh, how about we create a single machine learning model for end-to-end -end search? That means we get rid of, for example, indexing, and also the dozen you know machine learning models uh, that we need. Uh, for query understanding and ranking. Uh, but this might be a little bit too aggressive at this moment. Uh, and uh, maybe a hybrid approach that leverage both the classical approach and the uh, deep learning based approach is more realistic uh, just at this moment. But we hope things will uh, progress in a more uh, exciting uh, direc direction, which may eventually disrupt how search and e-commerce is done uh, in the future. So before I start uh, technical discussions, I would like to say a few things about online grocery shopping. So first, the grocery market is massive. Um, just in the United States and Canada, uh, which only makes up 15% 15 15 of the global market, uh, we are actually looking at nearly $1 trillion in sales each year. Uh, so, uh, exactly how big the grocery industry is. Um, in North America alone, it's about two to three times bigger uh, than books, uh, which is about $25 billion, which is where, which was where, you know, Amazon started. Um, and also, you know, much bigger than uh, consumer uh, electronics, which is about $400 billion. And by the way, the apparel business, uh, the fashion business, altogether is about Three hundred sixty uh, billion dollars. Um, so we are seeing a strong shift uh, to uh, shopping online, 
Uh, so in 2019, nearly half of all consumer electronics uh, were purchased online, while only 3% of grocery shopping happened online. We were already beginning to see a shift um, to purchasing groceries online, with analysts expecting to see it increase to 10 to 15% over the next three to five years. Um, but then uh, the unexpected happened, uh, and overnight, our grocery business changed. Uh, that is, of course, uh, COVID-19. It changed grocery shopping forever. Everyone is a customer of a grocery store, but prior to March 2020, less than 5% of grocery were bought online. In 2019, only about 3% of grocery shopping took place online, compared to 45% uh, of consumer electronics um, and 26% 20, of apparel and 15% of home, home furniture. So we've seen adoption accelerate significantly since then. In the past 12 months, uh, according to uh, CoreSight research, 60% of Americans have purchased the grocery online. Uh, online grocery will account for 21% of total grocery sales by 2025. So this is an estimate of, uh, uh, this is an estimated like $250 billion, which is uh, more than 60% increase over pre-pandemic uh, uh, estimates. So our business model brings some very, very interesting uh, challenges. Uh, here's uh, just one example. Um, we don't know what products are available on the shelves of our retailer. Uh, as a matter of fact, in most cases, the retailers themselves do not know either, unless for things that are off season. Uh, and here is an uh, illustration. So on the X axis, uh, we have the day of the year, and a particular product is not in stock between day uh, 165 and the day 181. So, so the part in the middle uh, of the chart, uh, we don't have anything here. For that part, we get the information from our retailer. That is, uh, this particular product is out of stock. Otherwise, the items are in stock, but they are not necessarily on the shelf uh, for various reasons. Um, it might be fine for retailers not knowing whether an item is on the shelf or not, but for, um, for an e-commerce, um, after customers add items to the shopping cart and check out, after we send shoppers um, all the way to the store, it is not good uh, if the item turns out to be uh, not available. So um, we need to estimate uh, or predict the availability of each item in each store at any given time. We have historical data, that is how often shoppers found the items on the shelf at the store at a particular time, right? Um, we also have a real-time data. So in the, in, the, in, the, in the chart we have here, um, the blue bar represents uh, the number of times actually this item is found on the shelf um, at a particular store at a particular time, right? And the orange bar indicates, you know, uh, the number of time this item is out of stock. It's not on the shelf. Um, so um, with this information, we can do uh, a lot of prediction. We need to know, we need to figure out uh, at what time uh, uh, for any product uh, uh, is out of, uh, you know, stock is not available uh, in a particular store. Uh, so this availability information uh, is a very, very critical information uh, for e-commerce, for uh, our business. Um, the uniqueness of grocery shopping also brings some very interesting opportunities. Uh, so uh, unlike consumer pro uh, electronics, for example, uh, people buy the same items again and again. Uh, in grocery shopping. This allow us, allows us to predict when our customer will most likely buy the same item again after a previous purchase. As you can see here, most of the products share, share this Gaussian distribution. 
after we perform a log transform on the interval purchasing days, which is on the x-axis. For example, it tells us basically people are most likely to buy bananas again between 8 to 16 days after their previous purchase. Uh, this is just one opportunity that allows us to know our customers better. Uh, for example, uh, it makes voice commerce more feasible. Uh, it's difficult for people to buy consumer electronics, say, uh, for example, a, a coffee machine, right, uh, through a voice interface, because people do need to compare um, and do research on the products to figure out which particular type of coffee machine to buy. But people don't need to do that to do this type of research for bananas or anything they buy over and over again uh, in grocery shopping. This allows us to not only recommend a single product, but also um, allows us to actually recommend an entire shopping cart to the customer because we know what and when um, they need. But there are challenges as well. If we always know uh, what and when customers need, uh, does that mean there's nothing we have to do, uh, nothing we can recommend uh, to our customers? So what about inspirations and uh, serendipity? Actually, there are big challenges and opportunities for recommendations uh, for e-commerce, uh, for grocery shopping. Uh, buying groceries, uh, I like listening to sounds, actually. Uh, there are sounds you listen over and over again, uh, but from time to time, you always want to discover new sounds. Groceries are ingredients for wonderful things that people can make. So clearly, we shall recommend the shopping lists and the recipes and all these type of things. These are the opportunities and, uh, and the challenges. So now let's uh, come back uh, to e-commerce search. Let's first take a look how brittle uh, e-commerce search engines are. So here, uh, we show some example of uh, uh, searching on, uh, on Walmart, right? So if you search for, um, if, if your query is red wine, $30, uh, this is what uh, you get from walmart.com. It shows you, it actually shows uh, yeast, like 12 pack yeast, uh, all the top three re results, uh, you know, a uh, 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 wine yeast, uh, 12 pack wine, uh, wine yeast. Right, and if you just change your query a little bit, still a tail query, uh, red wine forty dollars, and it shows you some other not very very uh, relevant uh, uh, products. Right, um, let's try this um, on Amazon. Uh, so the same query, red wine uh, forty dollars, and uh, uh, the picture I have on the uh, 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 left hand side. Uh, was actually uh, taken uh, uh, more than two years ago in 2019 and shows like, you know, instead of wines, it shows you uh, shoes and the pants and, uh, uh, and the hair. Uh, uh, why is that? Uh, if you look uh, a little bit deeper into it, you'll find that the color of these items are actually known as wine red. So wine red is a color. So instead of finding red wines, um, Amazon returns uh, products uh, whose color is wine red, right? So the picture on the right hand side was uh, uh, taken sometime last month, uh, the same type of query, different results, but um, uh, nonetheless, you know, the results are not relevant. The first one is an ad, it's a featured product. Um, it's actually uh, about vinegar. And then we have uh, uh, two, two, uh, two watches, right? So none of them are, are relevant. So um, here's the result for Instacart. Uh, for red wine, $40, we actually returned red wine miraculously, uh, but we didn't understand what $40 means. So, you know, the prices are you know, way off. Uh, so it's not really a very perfect uh, uh, result. And then, you know, uh, the one on the right hand side, Apple iPod, uh, you know, totally we uh, misunderstood the query. We return things that are actually related to Apple the fruit instead of uh, uh, Apple the brand, right? So, so the question here is, um, given e-commerce, 
um, is such a big business and the companies have been doing it for decades, why the quality is still so bad? I think e-commerce companies have big motivations to improve the search quality, of course, and maybe changes are coming soon. Uh, as more e-commerce companies are coming to business and more people are shopping online. But at least um, there's one thing I'd like to mention here, which is e-commerce search is actually not easy. Uh, so let's, let's see an example. In e-commerce search, we need to map queries uh, to choices of attributes and values. Uh, say you want to search for something like a blue long sleeve uh, dress, right? Um, you have inventories in many different categories, but for this particular search, uh, you need to know that blue is not just blue. It could be, um, you know, of color navy, of color azure, and, you know, these are all rel uh, related to the color blue. But long sleeve is really about the sleeve length attribute of our dress and the value is actually long. Uh, the query is not looking for a long dress or any other strange attribute that happens to have a value called sleeve. So in summary, for all these to happen correctly, for all these interpretations to happen correctly, we need to develop many models, rule-based or machine learning models to interpret the queries. And in order to build these models, we need to integrate data uh, from many different sources, such as catalog, taxonomy, or um, knowledge graph. Right. So let's come by, back to the to the to the wine quarter we we showed previously. Right. California red wine, 2019, uh, forty dollars. Uh, you know, for humans, this query is very very uh, specific and clear. But for uh, query understanding, for search, we need to understand, okay, the location is California, the category is red wine, the year is around 2019, and the price is, you know, somewhere between, uh, somewhere around, you know, $40. In order to have all these uh, correct uh, interpretations, a lot of models need to work together to make it happen. These models include, for example, all the way from language detection, speller, the stemming, uh, all the way to query rewriting, query relax relaxation, and entity linking, and all these kind of things. It's very, very complicated. A lot of work is involved, right? Um, and also, taxonomy and the catalog play a very, very important role uh, in query understanding, in search. You know, uh, these are the information uh, the models need to take into consideration uh, when they um, uh, 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 bootstrap uh, and, uh, you know, uh, support those uh, uh, core understanding tasks, right? Uh, but, you know, the data is actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, very, very complicated and sometimes very, very messy. Um, retailers, for example, adopt different product taxonomies and the Instacart works with 600, more than 600 retailers. They all have different, uh, potentially different taxonomies. Google tried to unify everything. So Google has this uh, uh, uniform uh, product taxonomy, which contains about 6,000 categories. But, you know, that might not be granular enough. So at Instacart, for example, just the taxonomy for groceries, we have more than 6,000 uh, 6, categories, right? So there are many issues with the quality of the catalog and, uh, uh, and the taxonomy. Uh, here, I just want to mention one particular issue. So basically, when a taxonomy or an ontology uh, grows beyond thousands of nodes, uh, it usually becomes impossible to manage. Uh, for many items, uh, there could be many legitimate places in the taxonomy that they can belong to. So here, example, in our Instacart taxonomy, we actually have two categories. One is uh, indoor plants under the category of floral. And there's another one, potted plants, also under the category of floral, right? But, you know, you can see there are really no way to differentiate the, between these two categories for many, many of the products in our system. Then there's also the product knowledge base. Uh, so everyone in an e-commerce business think knowledge graph is important, is really uh, wonderful, uh, and some strongly believe Knowledge Graph has the magical power to support every need of search, recommendation, and many other things. 
right? But few have a very good understanding of the difficulty of creating and managing a product knowledge graph. Um, uh, Luna Dome uh, and the Amazon team uh, has done a lot of work uh, on a product knowledge graph. And in fact, uh, they have a tutorial in this KDD on the topic of knowledge graph. Um, she asked a very interesting and important question, uh, which reveals the challenge of building a product knowledge graph. Um, the question is, what is the relationship between a product knowledge graph and a generic knowledge graph? Is product knowledge graph a small subset of the generic knowledge graph or a considerable subset of the uh, generic uh, uh, knowledge graph or product knowledge graph and the generic uh, uh, knowledge graph has a very, very big intersection. But actually the correct answer uh, at, a big, at the beginning uh, kind of uh, uh, surprising is that the generic uh, knowledge graph is a subset of the product knowledge graph, or in other words, product knowledge graph actually contain the generic uh, uh, knowledge graph. The reason is that, you know, everything in the generic uh, knowledge graph could be linked to some products in some way. We can interpret every query X that you submit to the Google search engine as, you know, you want to find information about X. And then we can interpret every query X that you submit to an e-commerce search engine as finding products about X. So we have three examples here, like insomnia, heartburn, or you know something like how to get rid of a raccoon, right? Um, Amazon is not really doing a very good job uh, for these queries. Uh, so here, the example like you know uh, insomnia, right? It returns uh, uh, several books, right? But in fact, on Amazon. There are so many products um, that can be used to alleviate the problem of insomnia. There are books about insomnia, medications, supplements, uh, even, even lights uh, can help the sleep or blankets can make you sleep longer or electronic devices that make white noise sound um, or essential oils uh, and many things, right? The reality is people have needs, um, you know, symptoms or conditions that they don't know how to take care of them. And this is the opportunity of a product search engine, right? But usually e-commerce search engine are not good at answering such questions. So people turn to Google, right? This picture here uh, actually shows how queries that contain the term how grows on Google over the years, right? And you, as you can see here, there's a, there's a surge of, uh, there's a surge of such queries around March and uh, uh, April of 2020. Uh, guess what? Uh, you know, people are asking about suggestions, you know, uh, for dealing with the COVID, right? So this is uh, um, the reality. Like people have needs, people have issues, and uh, they want, you know, solutions. They want to ask questions like, you know, what kind of product can help them solve the problem? But e-commerce search engine at this point are not serving this need. So in order for the uh, product knowledge graph to be able to solve these problems, they need to have knowledge in the form of the following, like a key phrase, uh, which could be any concept indicating a need or a symptom or a condition. And then a relationship, basically the relationship between this key phrase and uh, a set of solutions it could be a set of products or other uh, key phrases, and then you recursively find, you know, uh, uh, products uh, uh, in the downstream, right? So here's some example, like, you know, heartburn, and, uh, you know, uh, people may be looking for med medicines for heartburn, and you have a set of medicines. Uh, 2017 sci-fi movies, um, and the uh, top 10 of these uh, movies could be these kind of movies. So there could be, you know, a lot of information that we need to take into consideration in order to be able to serve these needs, right? Um, but such knowledge about human needs and the solutions are not really always ready in any structured data. Instead, um, we need to harness such knowledge from many, many different sources. For example, the World Wide Web. Um, take a look at these uh, two examples. Uh, 
Uh, one is about 10 healthy snacks uh, for children. And the other one is uh, 11 uh, best barbecue recipes, right? And you can imagine as a e-commerce search engine about the food and about grocery, these information are really, really very valuable to us. Uh, but how do we harness this type of knowledge is actually a very, very big challenge, right? Okay. So the biggest challenge for our e-commerce is really the data integration challenge. We have structured data, uh, which is like inventory catalog, uh, transaction data. We have semi-structured data, which you know trees and graphs uh, corresponding to taxonomy, ontology, and knowledge graph. We have unstructured data, could be you know customer reviews and the web pages. Right. Um, in most cases, e-commerce search, uh, you know. Uh, with the help of the classical IR, uh, only works on structured data or some semi-structured data such as uh, taxonomy, right? Uh, but the real challenge, the knowledge about the human needs and the products that can address those human needs is not in the inventory or in the taxonomy. It's in unstructured data that is very difficult to harness, uh, especially for individual small e-commerce companies because uh, doing this kind of information extraction and making sure they have high quality is actually very, very challenging, right? So here's a summary. What are the issues of e-commerce search? First of all, classical IR uh, uses inverted index that is turn-based. There's no semantics, right? Uh, and to support semantic matching, we actually need to perform query writing at many, many different levels. And to support tasks such as query rewriting, we need to develop many, many individual machine learning models, which are hard to maintain, hard to improve, uh, hard to keep track of. And to do a better job in understanding queries, we must incorporate heterogeneous types of data, such as web pages, which is very, very, uh, you know, it's a not easy problem. It's very, very challenging and very, very difficult, right? So naturally, we want to switch our attention to neural network uh, based information retrieval uh, because um, we are you know, talking about understanding queries, we are talking about understanding web documents. Isn't that you know, something a uh, natural uh, neural network uh, uh, is uh, doing very well uh, you know, for these domains, right? And there's a lot of work being done uh, in at least two areas. And one is neural network based uh, ranking models, right? Uh, this allows us to use many different types of features, including uh, text-based features to build a ranker. But this is quite limited uh, to just the, uh, the ranker, which is uh, you know, one component of the search system. Another idea is, to, um, is representation learning. So basically we learn uh, distributional representation for a query, and we learn distributional representation of a document. And then given a query, we turn, it, uh, we turn it into a distributional representation, and then we use approximate nearest neighbor systems to find relevant documents or relevant products for that particular query. Uh, this picture from Han Xiao actually nicely, very nicely illustrates the representation learning based IR uh, very, very uh, succinctly. Uh, so basically, we train the representation of queries and the products uh, using uh, engagement data, uh, user engagement data, right? And then we encode all products offline and store them. Uh, this basically corresponds to the indexing step in, step in the classical IR system. Right. And then given a query, we encode it um, online using the trained neural network model. This corresponds to the query passing or query understanding step in the classical IR. Then instead of using a typical inverted list based IR system, we use approximate nearest neighbor search to match embeddings in the common latent space. Right. Uh, one thing I would like to point out um, is that distribu distributional representation of products on its own has enabled many product uh, applications. Uh, one of the well-known uh, approaches is uh, product to vec uh, which work, uh, works pretty much the same way as uh, word to vec It contains, you know, it considers, uh, considers a shopping cart as a sentence and items in the shopping cart as words, and then it learns uh, these representations. And recently there's an effort to create contextual embeddings uh, 
and uh, and this leads to product to bird. And there's another approach which is called eBird, uh, consi which considers not just product to product relationships, but also considers phrases that are unique to uh, you know e-commerce, like you know product names, uh, brands uh, that are really not covered by you know. Uh, um, the bird trained on generic text, right? So the product embedding opened the door to support many applications such as a recommendation. And you can also fine tune uh, these embeddings to support other applications. For example, pre <coughs> predicting whether a customer uh, will check out and pay for his shopping cart, uh, et cetera, right? These are very, very uh, important. So um, many e-commerce companies started to adopt the neural uh, neural uh, e-commerce approach and extended the original approach to support uh, various scenarios. Uh, so, for example, the JD work, you know, uh, try to take into consideration personalized, uh, um, you know, information retrieval, right? Uh, bring personalized personal profiles uh, into the search, and the Walmart. Uh, tries to uh, take into consideration the session-based signals uh, in uh, matching products and uh, and the queries uh, instead of queries uh, query sessions. Right. So um, the neural information retrieval approach has many many advantages. Uh, in particular, it improves uh, recall uh, as it's no longer word for word matching, but it also has challenges. Uh, for example, it does not have the type of precision one expects in querying a database. Um, but other issues are more interesting to me that despite its advantage in improving recall, we still cannot address a large range of queries, such as those we introduced before, like insomnia, harbor, and how to get, get rid of a raccoon. Um, so in other words, a big problem in e-commerce search, as I mentioned earlier, is actually the data integration problem rather than just the query product the semantic matching problem. So a natural question is that, is there a system that is able to uh, answer any question related to uh, customer needs and the product. In other words, <clears throat> solving the data integration problem as well as the representation problem. Uh, specifically, instead of uh, components such as indexing, retrieval, and ranking, how about just one model that for any query predicts the most relevant results, right? Uh, so very recently, uh, Google introduced a vision called a uh, model-based search. It replaces indexing with model training, and it replaces retrieval and ranking with model inferences. Uh, so here, uh, you know, with this model, it is able to answer any question. Uh, this could be generic uh, queries such as, you know, home, home remodeling, uh, where's the Lincoln, uh, when was Lincoln born, or related documents, or even summarization. Right. And one thing we notice here is that it returns documents. Uh, it returns document IDs. Uh, in fact, the philosophy here is that in order to replace indexes with a single unified model, it must be possible uh, for the model itself to have knowledge uh, about the universe of document IDs uh, in the same way that traditional indexes do. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, model-based generic search um, uh, has the, this, uh, you know, the, the, Google, the Google vision has, the, has some uh, very big challenges. First of all, the document space is huge, right? Uh, Google indexes 30, 30 billion, uh, 30 trillion pages. And an update is very, very costly. It is estimated that Google actually crawls 25 billion pages every day. If you need to put all these things into a vocabulary, that is basically uh, unthinkable. It's just too big, right? Um, but e-commerce search actually is uh, much better in this aspect. Um, you know, for e-commerce, it's more like a uh, search against a database. And the product space is much smaller, uh, you know, usually one or two million products. And uh, if we want to work just on ads, because ads retrieval is quite similar to uh, e-commerce retrieval, uh, the featured product space is much, much smaller, just a few hundred thousand uh, that is considered very, very big, right? 
Um, now, given that e-commerce search is more related to database search, we, are, we should actually consider another direction of work, which tries to marry information retrieval and database queries. Uh, so this is the vision of uh, uh, neural databases. Compared with traditional da databases, the difference here is that each record or fact in the database is actually a natural language uh, sentence. And the model does everything. Um, you know, it does the selections and it does the joins. Um, however, one big challenge here is that the database, if the database is very large, the model does not know which part of the database to work on. In fact, it uses, it needs to use transformers to do the reasoning. And it's very well known that transformers are quadratic in complexity, which means it cannot handle very, very large amount of data. So, and also if you notice compared with uh, the Google approach, there's also one big difference here is that, you know, the neural database does not really, you know, work with document IDs or record IDs, but that might be the limiting factor of the neural database approach. If we can map queries to some IDs, it actually will be much easier for subsequent inferencing. So again, we consider e-commerce search problem, uh, a data integration problem. We have relational data, uh, we have taxonomies, and all these things are semi-structured data. We also have web data, which is unstructured. We want to convert everything to text so that we can train a huge language model out of it. But we also want to make sure the data is about the products. Uh, if we include the product IDs as tokens of the text and train a language model, that include those IDs, then the knowledge base we encode in the language model will naturally be about those products, right? So here's what we uh, talk about. Uh, we create a special ID tokens for each product, like, you know, uh, P123 uh, represent one particular uh, product. There's an alternative approach. Uh, you know, we use the uh, name of the product as the ID, and we enclose them in some special tokens. Uh, but for simplicity, we just uh, go with the first alternative, first approach. Um, so uh, we want to first unifying, uh, you know, uh, structured data uh, into text, right? And the structured data here are basically the inventory data with a lot of columns and attributes. And we create a set of uh, multiple uh, natural language templates for each attribute. And then you will use these uh, templates uh, to convert um, um, the information about this uh, uh, each particular uh, product into a natural language sentence. For example, P123 is Lucin milk with reduced fat. And we also have, you know, all these attributes and we can use uh, these templates to convert them into a uh, natural language text, like the attributes of P123 include organic, gluten-free, and culture and uh, things like that. So, you know, everything through this conversion becomes text. And then for other transactional uh, data, uh, you know, uh, for transactional data, right? For each type of trans, uh, uh, transaction, uh, we create some natural language templates, like, you know, uh, top 10 converted items for search quality milk is blah, 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 a customer bought some things uh, together and all these kind of things. And we also convert product, product knowledge graph ontology and taxonomy, these semi-structured data into text forms. And uh, we use the same methodology, uh, basically uh, templates, and we use templates to do the uh, conversion. And then finally, unstructured data, uh, recipes, web articles, and all these kinds of things. The only thing we need to do is we perform entity linking, and then we embed product IDs such as you know, P123 uh, in the document. So originally, this part is the most difficult part for, you know, when we talk about the harnessing the data, uh, you know, for information retrieval, and now it becomes actually the easiest part, right? Now, with all these kind of information unified as text, so we can pre-train a language model uh, on top of that, right? And uh, here we consider basically uh, the pre-training, uh, you know, is for a masked language model. Uh, we add product IDs and words used in Instacart as additional tokens in the vocabulary set. And, uh, you know, we have an input sentence like P123 is Lucin milk with reduced fat. And we do the masking and we try to, uh, you know, uh, predict uh, uh, the mask, right? And then, you know, 
uh, after we pre-train this thing, uh, we do a lot of uh, fine tuning with uh, specific tasks, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, this particular task is a document retrieval. Uh, we can treat a document retrieval as a multi-class, multi-label classification process, right? And uh, we have a particular training data, and the, the labels here uh, are actually soft labels, uh, which are, you know, the probability, the likelihood of, uh, you know, this product being an uh, answer for this particular query. And this comes from, you know, uh, click the data, right? And uh, we can also do uh, document recommendations, uh, you know, what are the uh, related document or recommended document for a particular uh, product. We can also do, you know, uh, document encoding. So this enables us to handle um, new, uh, you know, products if we have uh, new things uh, come into the inventory and we can use this thing uh, to, you know, encode that particular product without, you know, uh, retrain or uh, pre-train, uh, you know, the entire corpus again, right? Um, however, there are still a lot of uh, challenges here, uh, you know, for this neural uh, network-based uh, uh, approach. Uh, we uh, are able to uh, integrate all these uh, different sources of data into one big corpus and we train uh, language model on top of it. This enables us to, you know, handle um, uh, all different kinds of uh, our queries. You know, uh, like what is the uh, the the uh, healthy snacks for kids, and uh, you know what are the relevant items uh, people might be interested in uh, if they are, you know, uh, celebrating July the Fourth or the Labor Day and all these kind of things. Uh, but the challenge here is that I, you know, uh, just like uh, neural information retrieval, it won't be able to answer very, very specific, uh, you know, accurate, uh, you know, very precise, uh, you know, queries, right? So um, before this thing can can mature, before we can, you know, um, uh, improve the quality and also the scalability of this approach, uh, we are still taking a hybrid approach where, you know, we use... Uh, um, neural network uh, uh, to generate signals, uh, like for example, here for query classification, we uh, use neural network to encode the query, and we also use the same model uh, to generate the classification signals uh, for this particular query. And then the retrieval takes two paths. One is the embedding-based recall, and the, the other one is uh, keyword-based recall, just like, you know, in the classical approach. And then we unify the results and then we perform ranking and everything. So this is uh, basically the current status. It's still a hybrid approach. We want to have both uh, the benefits from recall uh, and the, the benefits of classical uh, information retrieval, which is really about the precision, right? Um, so uh, the conclusion here is that you know, uh, e-commerce search is very, very challenging, uh, mostly because, you know, you have heterogeneous types of data you need to integrate. Um, and uh, and uh, we always try to convert the data uh, to structure the data, right? You know, for knowledge graph, uh, for taxonomy, and for web pages, we want to harness the knowledge from the web pages and put them into the knowledge graph. So at, you know, uh, search time, we can leverage uh, the information there. Uh, which is very, very challenging. Uh, at this moment, a hybrid approach is still the most realistic one uh, for uh, you know e-commerce search. Uh, we rely on neural network models for high recall, and we also rely on you know classical approaches for pre precision and the scalability. But uh, this end-to-end model-based IR uh, is becoming increasingly more attractive because it will enable you to answer many, many very, very interesting questions, um, you know, uh, really addressing uh, the need, uh, the symptoms or the conditions of people. Uh, so, you know, um, uh, bringing everything together, right? Uh, but there are also many challenges, like, you know, vocabulary size, uh, how do we handle updates, um, text, uh, you know, description generation, and all these kind of things. Uh, but these are the uh, interesting problems uh, to work on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Haijun. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, thanks for sharing with us uh, many of the uh, very subtle yet very important difference between 
uh, general research, IR and uh, e-commerce, especially the grocery product researching, uh, very insightful. Now, uh, we have some questions from the Rocky Chat channel here. Uh, one particular question is, uh, can you elaborate a bit more on the, the, uh, the concept that a generic knowledge graph is a subset of product knowledge graph? I think that it's not the most intuitive uh, one. Uh, I see. Okay, so this is not really uh, an idea that uh, um, uh, from myself. It's uh, uh, you know uh, a lot of people have been talking about this, especially uh, you know uh, uh, Amazon uh, team on you know knowledge graph. So basically, you can think about a general purpose generic uh, knowledge graph. There are many many things in this knowledge graph, and for anything on this knowledge graph, you basically can ask a question: What is a product related to this concept? Right? Whether this is a person, a place, you know, a book, or you know, uh, anything, uh, or you know, uh, some very vague uh, concept, you can always ask the question. What is the product? What, what is the product that is related to this thing? If people is interested in this particular concept or particular entity, what kind of products uh, he might you know uh, be looking for? He might be interested in, right? So in this sense, um, the generic knowledge graph could be a subset uh, of the uh, product knowledge graph. It's like you know from anything from the just generic uh, knowledge graph, you can have a edge toward related products. That is uh, uh, the easiest way uh, to sort of think about this question. Thanks. Uh, I have uh, one more question for you. So someone asked, how does personalization fit into the new end-to-end -end IR framework? Yeah, that is a very, very uh, good question. It is actually very challenging. Uh, so that makes, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, this end-to-end -end, uh, uh, solution uh, uh, even more uh, uh, sort of, uh, 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 you know, difficult uh, uh, compared with the, uh, you know, uh, the classical approach, right? So basically, uh, in order to uh, support personalization, you have to have something uh, to represent uh, uh, each individual user, right? So you need to take that into consideration. Um, so the easiest way is like, you know, uh, for the input, you always uh, have this uh, uh, personal representation into this uh, uh, recommendation, uh, in, into this uh, uh, interface, right? So you take a query, uh, you can represent in many, many different ways. And you can also, you know, um, have the representation of the entire session instead of just that particular query. But then you can also have a representation of that person, and that will be the input to your uh, uh, to the model. Uh, so that is fine. Uh, but the challenging part is how is this, you know, uh, how is this trained, right? So uh, in your training data, we are talking about the converting all the information we have into a unified text and we train a language model on this text. So majority of this text is generic. It's, uh, it's true for everybody. So for example, you have information about what are the top 10, you know, uh, 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 best uh, snacks for, for kids. This is uh, some information you have from the web and this knowledge is uh, uh, generic. It's true, to, uh, could be true to everybody. But then you have some, um, uh, transaction data, uh, which uh, you know, in the in the in the talk, I mentioned that uh, uh, you can convert them into text, and you train you know uh, a language model over the text. And in order to support personalization, you have to have the person ID in this uh, uh, you know uh, uh, text as well. But uh, that's going to be, to be uh, quite difficult. Usually, you know, uh, an e-commerce uh, you know, system supports many, many users. Uh, in terms of the, you know, uh, the size, the number of the users is could be much, much bigger than the uh, the number of uh, uh, products, which makes uh, this representation, uh, you know, uh, encoding uh, 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 much more difficult. So, uh, uh, one way to uh, deal with this is, you know, uh, instead of have uh, a representation for each individual users. Uh, we use other things uh, 
to represent uh, uh, each user, uh, like the history and uh, other meta information and all these kind of things, uh, so that uh, we can uh, uh, train the language model and also support that in the uh, online, uh, you know, uh, influencing uh, stage. But uh, agreed that the personalization will be a very challenging issue uh, for this end-to-end -end approach. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think the, your audience is actually a very interesting talk. So maybe we can take one more question. Yeah. So uh, the one last question here is, uh, uh, you mentioned that taxonomies over 1K can be challenging to manage. So what is your recommendation for dealing with search or recommendations across a large and diverse product space that covers a large taxonomy space? Yeah, uh, so, so basically, you know, human curated uh, taxonomies uh, will have lots and lots of problems, right? So, however, you know, uh, whatever you do, like, uh, you know, uh, you have lots of uh, talented uh, taxonomists, uh, you know, uh, doing a very, very good job. But once that taxonomy is beyond 2,000 nodes or 3,000 nodes, it becomes just really, really very difficult to manage. The reason is because, you know, we try to, as a, as a taxonomy, we try to put everything, put things in this world, or I mean, uh, uh, for e-commerce, like all the products, organize them into a tree structure. But in reality, this is not feasible because there are many, many different ways, you know, to classify a, a product. Uh, naturally, they belong to many, many different categories. If you have a small number of categories, maybe you can manage, but if you have 2000 categories or beyond, it's impossible uh, to manage, right? So, you know, sometimes it's necessary just for traditional uh, reasons. Um, you know, we still use that taxonomy. Uh, in uh, many cases, like for example, Instacart, we actually need to work with many retailers and, uh, you know, uh, we have to have something to consolidate uh, all these kind of things um, in a taxonomy. Um, this uh, is necessary, um, but, you know, as long as we can be consistent, uh, we know it is not a very, very possible job, but as long as we, we are consistent, it can still be fine. Being consistent means like, you know, if a product can be in both places, we somehow have a rule uh, to say it always go to uh, one place. Uh, you don't want to use different rules to classify uh, those uh, products, it will create a problem. So this is a way just to, you know, put things in a, into a, into a, onto a map, into a neighborhood and all these kind of things, giving them an address uh, in this uh, taxonomy. But in reality, when you want to search for that, you need to have other structures and some other data driven structures uh, that will be able to, uh, you know, uh, link to these uh, uh, products. And this you this structure usually is a is a is a graph instead of a, a taxonomy, right? The taxonomy it's more related to the inventory, while this knowledge graph or this other representation is more related to how you access your products through search or through other mechanism. This is for for retrieval, so they they have different purposes. But you know, uh, it's very necessary. It's still very necessary to have the catalog to manage the inventory, but if you want to do a very good job in information retrieval, you need to have some other mechanism to access the data. Thank you. Thank you, Haishin, for the in-depth uh, explanation. Now, in interest of time, if you have more questions, you can interact with the Haishin offline. And thank you again, Haishin, for the nice talk, and uh, thanks for attending KDD. See you. Yeah. Bye -bye. Thank you, Feida. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah,